Hey guys, I'm Richard Fitzgerald. This is Dubai Works, where we interview the business leaders making a difference in this great city. That business with scalability was very interesting to me. I like building something that has legacy. Hi guys, welcome back to another week of Dubai Works Business Podcast. I'm Richard Fitzgerald and I'm joined by the CEO and founder of Ed8, Mr. Tom Wolf. Uh, welcome to the show. It's great to be here. So a uh, quick intro into Tom and we have a very exciting conversation lined up. So as I said, CEO and founder of Ed8, he moved to Dubai 15 years ago after a brief stint as a professional rugby player with Harlequins in the UK. Uh, very brief. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but a reputable club and probably in the top level at the time. Yeah. yeah very good. What position were you? I played six or eight. Oh, well, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so that's a flanker uh, that they're known but as fast. Most of the time I spent getting splinters on a bench. Okay. Yeah. Running oranges on, on off the pitch. So, okay. Yeah. Team effort. Team, team effort. effort. <laughs> team effort. <laughs> okay. So brilliant. So he worked in uh, with Accenture Financial Services. And then after uh, five or six years of that, uh, started uh, out on his own. So he set up at eight in 2011 and has grown it to what we'll hear is uh, a company that works predominantly in the UK and the US uh, with 10,000 students on their books uh, this year. Yeah. Last, this year. Uh, and a fascinating story. Looking forward to talking and finding out all about it. So Welcome. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, you and I know each other from your, your, your Nike days with the Nike run clubs and yeah. stuff like that. Um, I didn't realize that you were doing all this as well at that time. So you were, you were, did you get into coaching after rugby? Uh, yes. Yeah, so I think the, the coaching had always been a, a real passion play of mine. Um, I did a lot of, actually, when I stopped playing rugby, I did a lot of refereeing. I joined the IRB Rugby 7 circuit. Um, I did a little bit of coaching with the, um, the England development squads but realized it was, it was no kind of professional pathway for me. And so it just became, remained a hobby mm. and, and just really enjoyed it. Um, I, um, back in the day, invested in some gyms here before the kind of current boom of kind of private um, health clubs. Yeah. And so I um, had a business here for um, about 12 years. Um, and we partnered with Nike to, to, to really drive community activation yeah. through sport. Um, and so how do you enable people who would otherwise not be able to to to, to pay for expensive gym memberships, be mm. part of a, a running community. And those communities had existed in other parts of the world, but not quite existed yet in Dubai. And so, um, you know, you know kudos to the, the Nike leadership. Uh, they, they took a big bet. And as you saw, we had, we evolved over a number of years to have We Run Dubai, the first ever kind of big math, Nike mass participation sporting events. Yeah. But I think the, the heart of it was how do you get everyday normal people in Dubai to be able to be more active and yeah. build that kind of element of brand experience through sports rather than just out of home kind of, you know, uh, the usual media buy. And so Nike invested in developing community and they were one of the first back in 08, 09 to really see the power of investing in communities to drive commercial acquisition. Yeah. Amazing. Um, so we'll get back to that a bit later, but I think the important note there is that, you know, you're involved in Dubai community scene. I know I found a community running club like that pretty good at the yeah. when I moved here first. Uh, so it was pretty cool to so you kind of involved in many aspects of it. How did Ed Age come about? What was the idea at the start? I think it's, uh, there's many respects when you, you some people some think about building a business, whereas Ed Age has, has intrinsically been in me since I, I was the first in my family to go to university. I was the first generation of student debt in the UK. Um, I studied Islamic finance. And so um, really, it was always seemed crazy okay. that students um, ended up paying for all their tuition fees up front for university. Universities didn't have any skin in the game. Yeah. And then if you came from a lower income household, you pay, you weren't able to pay up front. So you had to get debt. That debt cost anything between kind of six and sometimes up to 30% in interest charges. And it just felt criminal to me that actually the students who needed the access to education most were sometimes paying two to three times the cost to get access to the best universities. And so really, I wanted to level the playing the field and give more students from background like myself, the chance to really get access to the best grad school programs. Sounds simple in theory. <laughs> yeah, it sounds really simple. I mean, we, we, we've kind of played with the model, really what we wanted to do, and we started out with a peer-to-peer -peer model. So we were one of the first peer-to-peer -peer lending platforms mm. um, to, to kind of be launched. It's just really tough building a two-sided marketplace. And so, so as you, we touched upon earlier, I'd be experienced of building 
you know, commercial success through community. And so we tried to build community and that's obviously the first step. But when you build a peer-to-peer -peer platform, you can spend often as much time dealing with one person who's put $10 into the platform yeah. to support a student yeah. as you can someone who's put multiple millions in. And so it was just a very inefficient uh, element. But So just to explain that, so basically when someone has a great idea, they say, I've got a good idea, but you don't have uh, providers, so you don't have makers or a marketplace and then you don't have customers so you actually have to do acquisition on both sides uh, which is that what you mean by being difficult yeah it's, it's exactly that so in often in one marketplace you you create a product and then you sell that product to a customer yeah whereas actually in these double-sided marketplaces you have a situation where you have to create, you the have platform. To create the platform and then create the community and then and then sell to both sides of the customer so we had to sell to a student and, and build the students who wanted and all of our students get an interest-free loan. So we had plenty of the students on one side, but then you end up with this asymmetrical because then we need patrons and people to fund them. Mm. So we quickly realized that actually a, peer, a pure peer-to-peer -peer play was, was not going to work. Uh, There's all the kind of rage and trend, and it absolutely. still kind of is, like, but there, as you pointed out, a core issue with the idea of being difficult to get off the feet. Yeah, it's difficult. I mean, I, I, I had track record. I mean, I'd been... I, I, I partnered with Just Giving in the UK, brought them to the Middle East. So I had a, you know, a track record of peer-to-peer -peer giving yeah. and tried to learn as much from that and translate it across. But it's just a really tough, and particularly all of my businesses have been bootstrapped. And when you're bootstrapping in marketplace businesses, it's really, it, it's just incredibly tough because mm. you're having to sell two customers at the same time. Yeah. Your, your acquisition costs are, are double typically what they would be in, 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 a, in a more one-sided marketplace. So, so um, the, the mission on the website says to make education more affordable. Yep. So uh, that, as you described, it's to make people like you were to be able to go to university and not have, you know, we, we all know how much uh, student fees and debt uh, the, the global issue on that um, is is that uh, what you're solving? Yeah, so we work with the world's best grad school programs to enable students to be able to from underrepresented communities to be able to access the grad school programs now. So we're talking about the best MBAs and, and master's level courses or vocational boot camps in software engineering, cybersecurity, not post grads. Um, all graduate level, so typically they may have done some undergraduate, may have done community college. Mm. Um, often the people from lower incomes have not finished college, so they haven't actually got the certification, but they've got the debt. Mm. So we help those students effectively get a credential that's going to lead to an outcome and very much the jobs of the future. So I say cybersecurity, data science, AI. Um, mm. and, then, and then those students pay only once they graduate and get a job. And so it's a kind of study now, pay later model. And so both EdAid and the university are effectively investing in that student and supporting them up front. Mm. And then those students pay back. So it becomes like a, a revolving endowment where the students from underrepresented communities now, typical household income is sub thirty thousand dollars. And the median the after US, yeah, 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 right, exactly. yeah, yeah. And then the median afterwards is about seventy two thousand dollars. So we're doubling the household income of every student we fund. They pay their fees back into the pot and then we enable the next student to go the next semester. So how do you become a lender? How do you become a bank? <laughs> where <laughs> yeah, do you get well, all the money? Well, you, you, the, 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 this is where being early in the fintech space, A, you can afford to make some mistakes and learn, but the power of financial technology and the, the, the fintech industry as it's emerged, particularly out of the last financial crisis, was how do you enable, um, take splice what banking is and find ways to create value. At the moment, our lending system, I don't want to go too far down the kind of traditional consumer credit but what happens effectively is that you know, students from low-income backgrounds have poorer credit scores. They are slightly higher risk, typically, and then they pay considerably more for the cost of their debt as a result. But it, it, they tend to use models from consumer credit from people that buy cars and go credit card shopping. But if you take the world's best graduate schools and vocational programs, their students have exceptional outcomes. So they're actually a much lower credit risk. But mm. on the front end, they're a much higher credit risk because they have no credit score or they have a very low credit score. Okay. So we're doing two things. One is we're, 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 we're giving them the lowest cost credit they can have, which is an interest-free loan. And the two is it's about driving that economic empowerment and building their credit score. So actually, the, our system is loaded that your credit score today is often predetermined by your parents' household income and where you live and your postcode. Mm. And so the only way you can help people break through is by rewriting the way that you do do lending. And so yeah. we we rewrote the way you do lending. We have a shared balance sheet with our universities that effectively says we're going to take the empty seats in the classroom and fill them with students from low income backgrounds that would have, wouldn't have had, had previously had access. Yeah. And so the university now only gets paid 
when their students succeed. And mm. so you've got this now kind of shared risk, shared reward model that we've never yeah. had in, in higher education. And fundamentally, I believe that the whole of higher education will go to a shared risk, shared reward model. Interesting. Some of those universities, a friend of mine anecdotally uh, was finishing up with a startup here a few months ago, uh, COVID happens, and then uh, is now doing a master's at MIT, uh, and he got a 20-year loan approved in 24 hours. Yeah. How does that work? <laughs> uh, there's a lot of debt out. There's a lot of credit out there yeah. that's looking for a home. Yeah. So actually, if you're going to a leading school, um, it'd be interesting to hear, maybe you can tell me offline what their interest rate uh, is, is. But typically, and people like you and I now can, uh, in the stage we're at in our life, we can probably go get credit from anywhere. And this is the part of the problem is almost by the fact that they're your friend, they're probably someone who's had a startup, had a business. They might make, make pay slightly higher for their credit. Okay. There are multiple hundreds of millions of people out there in the world who have the, the you know, talent is equally distributed, but the opportunities really are not. Um, and so what you have is those people just locked out the financial services system because they come from India, Southeast mm. Asia, um, they come from South America or just low income households in the US. So they don't, uh, they don't take a box they in terms of... They fall off the bottom of, of a traditional credit score a typical FICO credit score model, which is uh, discrimination, or is it more? Uh, it's not it, it, No, it's 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 not. It wouldn't be discussed as discrimination because it'd be, it'd be risk model based. It wouldn't be based on the fact that the decision wouldn't be saying you're you're, you're a, an African American, therefore we're not funding you. But there is some there is an actual bias built into the models. Yeah, based on postcode. Yeah. So um, African American communities in America will have slightly higher crime rates, and therefore they won't lend to people mm. in those further exacerbating the opportunity gap mm, yeah and so uh, you know, the 63 percent of our, our our students we fund are people of color um you know the, the majority it's almost 90 percent of first generation uh, wow. students do you approve them or does the university also approve so them? first of all they have to get accepted to their program yeah so they'd have to get accepted to doing the software engineering program at columbia and once they've done that then, then we they'd be referred to EdAid, and then we would do the 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 kind of character and uh, capability assessment on their their affordability. Yeah. So for us, we don't look at hardcore credit scores. What we look at is that are they going to be likely to be able to afford to make their payments? Mm. And we've built our own risk model okay. internally at EdAid to assess that based on the outcomes from the program. And then when a student onboards with us, we start early. We help them build out their LinkedIn profile. We start to really kind of coach them through how do they present themselves professionally online mm. because the the ATS, which is applicant tracking systems, will be looking for keywords when they're searching for doing the grad searches. And when you apply for a job, the first thing someone's going to do is look at your LinkedIn profile. Okay. And so it's how do you present yourself professionally online uh, before you even start your course. Wow. So you're you're vested in their whole success. It's not just, you're not like a ruthless bank who's just looking at no, the No, we numbers. don't get paid by the, the, the student doesn't pay us, the university pays us Without our, our fees. Yeah, yeah. So, so we're effectively, uh, think of it almost in your parlance kind of, um, from some of the communities that we listen to this, we're lending as a service. So we operate the regulated technology platform. Yeah. So we do the origination, the collection, full servicing all in house. Mm. And then, but a lot more of what we do is where the kind of fintech and edtech blend yeah. is that we, we work those students to really drive the outcome because if we don't drive an outcome and shift the GDP of the students that we fund, we don't get paid. Okay. Interesting. Lending as a service. Yeah. Brilliant. Is there an, uh, last, last, yeah. <laughs> last or something. Um, yeah, couple, loads of questions. Really interesting. Uh, the like, can we talk a little bit about the university and education system? Yeah. So I think there was a meme going around the other day. Uh, subscriptions, and they're saying that the TV subscriptions for Netflix yeah. are going up, and then it's Harvard fifty five thousand yeah. dollars a year, something like that. Um, uh, and there's a lot of um, you know I, I've read recently that some big old boarding schools are closing down. Uh, people, the famous, uh, well-known U.S. commentator on media and tech, uh, that I can't think of his name, Scott Galloway. Scott, yeah. Scott he, he talks a lot. He's a professor. Yes, and, and yeah, he talks great a, mind. Amazing. Yeah, he's written a book called... He's actually, he should be part of this club. Yeah. We should do a shout-out to Scott because this is the bald white men's club. So, <laughs> yeah. so, it's, so it's, yeah. uh, he should definitely be here part yeah, of this. Yeah, he should. Yeah, we'll tag him. Yeah. Uh, big dog. He might tag him. Uh, what he calls himself. Yeah, no, but so he's amazing on education, yeah. right? And there's a whole kind of trend on ed tech and why it's disruptive. I was at an M and A thing recently here, and I was just blown away about how profitable the education system is, mm -hmm. and I can see how people get attracted to it. But it's profitable because it hasn't been disrupted. Uh, and you know, talking about these big universities in the U.S., 
you know, and, and two questions like how how do they continue to charge? Why are they not disrupted fully yet? And secondly, on the lending side, um, you know, one of the reasons I just assumed that the loan is approved very quickly is because not just EdAid, but financial institutions over the years would have seen them as good ways to get young person on books early for debt. So they they have a re- they have built up different formulas to you to work to give out loads of student loans. So they're kind of well versed in this space as well. Yeah, well, let's let's uh, uh, deal with those in reverse. We fundamentally have a, a a huge issue with with the way that our consumer credit. The world is run on consumer credit that we we entrench everybody in a, in a credit kind of, cards and credit things. cards pay away models and student debt and student debt is effectively the gateway drug of of of, of the pyramid of drugs it's the kind of class c it's the marijuana it's getting them hooked early on something light and then and then build them in so as you write banks want to be able to bring you in and the model has been predicated on get you in on your student debt maybe an interest for your overdraft when you're when you're young mm. you know, in your first credit card and then own that customer throughout their wow. life cycle the, the the first home the second home yeah the, the boat and 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 hence and then they wonder why they have a consumer credit crisis so wow. um I, I i fundamentally believe that we we will rewrite um the way that we lend particularly to young people and, and often miss sell debt to young people by ensuring that the university is part of that as a stakeholder. So I think where university strength can come and where I think that some of them will continue to prosper if we segue in is that if they're willing to say in the future, you don't take your debt from from a third party bank, which is going to charge you higher interest rates that, that's effectively building an arbitrage, paying their customers. A What's the typical loan. interest rate on a yeah. student loan? Um, uh, in the US, they're around you know, between six and eight percent. For, for for the lowest quality risk, the private, that's the government loan, same in the okay. UK, six to eight percent government loan. The private loans go up into to, 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 to north of twenty percent. Ouch. Yeah, compounding <laughs> year on year. So actually, what you find is that debt, the student debt, um, is just it, it's rising by hundreds. Of, the interest rates are rising by hundreds of millions of dollars, you know, every week. God, that is a problem. So, 1.6, <laughs> 1.6 trillion in the US. But more importantly, come back to universities. Do I think universities are dead and, and higher education is dead? Absolutely not. Education has always evolved. Mm. These are some of the strongest brands. They have they have lived through the Reformation. They have lived through uh, civil wars, uh, multiple world wars. They will continue to survive. Are they the most innovative hotbeds of, of, of leading ed tech? Absolutely not. Um, they are bastions of citadels of kind of caste systems and i think they need to change i think you know having a situation whereby you have um only the elite of the elite of the elite and so what you end up and you you referenced scott galloway earlier but effectively what happens is that in a time of crisis actually all that happens is the most elite institutions that have the endowments become stronger and stronger and you'll end up with this kind of um hourglass model where you have a lot of very elite, you have a real pinch point for, for the middle mm. where it no longer makes sense if you're a middle class household to go to higher education. And then you'll have a lot of people on the bottom who are being missold into poor quality programs. And it's almost that that's the biggest risk is that there is a, a huge base of the pyramid of fairly lousy higher education programs okay. that, are, that are that just really trying to hard sell where they, they, the student has all the, all the risk. The university has no skin in the game. There isn't all of the extra value out of the brand and the network. Mm. And I think that's where some of these arguments of not being on campus and suddenly going to Zoom and finding out that actually my kids only get all six hours of lectures, mm. no wraparound support, no network, no alumni association, everything else. So And the and the value of that to be to, you know, to help you get a job after it isn't as good either. And and so to your point, I think the, the whole university model changes when you come back to value is rather than cost. Uh, and there's been this idea that price should be a leading indicator of quality. So all the universities have done is just have, have outstripped inflation by you know, you know 450% over the last 15 years. And so tuition's gone up by 450% uh, and, and inflation by you know, 50% compound over the last Simply how has that happened? Is it supply and demand or people, is the debt there? It's supply and demand. Universities just don't grow enrollments. So yeah. how do you make your, your brand? It's a bit like... Um, Patek Philippe not releasing more of their watches. Mm. It's a bit, and so despite the market and the ambition for more people to buy Birkin bags, and there's yeah. more people with disposable income around the world over the last 20 years, Birkin don't make any more bags. Mm. Yeah, Hermes aren't printing more bags. Yeah. And so you've got a bit like fashion retail. Higher education actually, in my mind, mimics fashion retail. You have a, a small number of very elite brands. Luxury, that yeah. They can just continue to push their price up. What's happened is you then had everybody else that isn't an elite brand continuing to push their prices up. 
And so you don't get the same network, the kickers and everything else that you get. get but when you that. talk about these ones, are they, you know, the ranking of universities, are they, uh, you know, pretenders online who are just kind of set up? Are they, I mean, there's, there's too many to speak about, but I think rank, rankings are total BS in my mind. So, so they're, they're, they're often based on size of classrooms and, and your admit rate. So if you've got 10,000 applications and you turn, you turn your 99% of those, you're a great institution because you've turned people away that want to pay you, want to build a better life. Mm. I think that whole thing changes. The value of a degree in the future will be what is the, what is the effectively growth in household income and the impact for that individual? And then the payment should be based on the impact for that individual not this kind of nominal upfront tuition fee. But when you're choosing where to apply for, how do you uh, qualify that? I, well, I, I, I think it's, that's an element that I think there's going to be a huge explosion in terms of um, ed tech and innovation. Yeah. It's how do you really measure the value of a course yeah. and what's your value versus another student's value. It's like when you, there's these, I think Glasshouse is a website in the US that really reviews yeah. the quality Glassdoor. of a, Glass? Glassdoor. Glassdoor. The, yeah. Is it, yeah, the employees and it's kind of a, Review place. Are there ones for that for universities? I mean, the real linked, truth. Linked to the, there's no real truth. Yeah. And I think that a bunch of different companies have started to try and find the way to the real truth. It's funny when you speak to um, students from affluent backgrounds, they talk about education being enlightening, be, being um, uh, the experience, the campus experience, the journey. When you talk to middle and lower income students, they want an outcome. Mm. They want to be able to get a better job. They want to be able to feed their Absolutely. kids. Yeah. They want to be able to, often they tend to be slightly older. They've, 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 they've taken a few attempts to graduate college, maybe had children younger, and they want to build a better life. And it's, there is this great um, bifurcation in the market where universities are selling academic enlightenment and campus experience. And actually the customer wants a credential and an outcome. And so I think that's where you're going to see real innovation and how do you get these stackable ability to, you know, who's, who is going to be able to develop the, the new delivery model? Is there, a, is there an Amazon or a Netflixification of this? Mm. Is there a kind of, if you look at Jake Scott, as I said, he, he's taken these micro credential models through his, his company, um, and, uh, section four, and he's delivering a business strategy course for $500. Mm. I think they had an enrollment start this week and they got a thousand attendees. Mm. That can e you can easily see that going to a hundred thousand or a million million enrollees because right. what he'll do is he'll start to bring in his best compatriots from his different universities that he's got and say right now you run product strategy right now you run finance a bit like masterclass in a way but yeah, but but a thousand times better yeah masterclass is great if you if if, if you're wealthy and you want to want to watch Anna Winter talk about her experiences yeah it's, but this is this is a curriculum this is education this is and once you add add, add the, the pathway the future is going to be then how that intersects with Apple or Google. So they end up having a badging. Mm. And so the, I think there was a recent survey that, that more students would want to graduate from an internship at Google than they would Harvard mm. now. And so actually when you start to look at wow. how can you marry real world education from real world business leaders, but potentially be able to um, have a poly education approach where you've got many different providers that you can stack those credentials via a, a portal. So you can study from the MOOCs were a good start at that, but ultimately mm. they don't lead to a credential, nothing that's really respected in the market. But once you get the respect of a big power brand, so Apple has yeah. Apple University that delivers a Scott Galloway course paired with um, uh, you know, something delivered and not in a gimmicky way, but in a real genuine way that the Collinson brothers are delivering you know, how to really build a business from scratch and how to bootstrap in financial services. Yeah. And then they're getting they're in there with that. Then okay. I think you've got a course that's actually the, the future. And then that enables right. students to be able to actually have real jobs on the side so you can still study and work. Yeah. I think the apprenticeship model is the best model for the future. It just needs to get completely torn up and rewritten. I totally agree. Like we see that with very good universities here and graduates in Dubai. And, you know, I think not many people recognize what talent is in, in the market in terms of graduates. Um, and, you know, we play around with the Augustus Academy term in terms of media education but just and i totally agree on that sort of uh you know tr education process on the job but on the uh the this sort of idea of disruption is uh the examples you're talking about uh and i heard of another one where it's like an mba on an app which is five minutes a day or something like that that's down that's over here it's tech ed tech and then over here you've got harvard yeah. or whatever but um why does disruption always have to be that or that? Like, why can't these guys evolve a little bit more? Um, you know, and like the, the, the universities in the US, 
you mentioned it, they're amazing brands and they actually do, you know, we have Harvard Review in Abu Dhabi, MIT do something here, NCI do something here. You know, I, I want that those brands to continue. I don't want, you know, for those brands to what happens, the local newspaper or the newspaper brands to be killed by Facebook. Like we don't want. Yeah, the I, I, I don't think they're going to be. I think where the innovations come uh, so far and will continue the um, there's a business called Trilogy Education. They um, build boot camps in partnership with the world's best universities. So with um, uh, Columbia, so UC Berkeley, yeah. so it's a, it's a partnership um, delivered in a hybrid model with the faculty, six month intensive courses that lead to great outcomes. They got bought by 2U, um, who's a, 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 um, an, an ed tech player, the largest listed ed tech platform in the world. Um, they build great online education experiences. So what, they, okay. they what do, do they know, the owner? What, um, so, uh, so to the, you, how do we know of them? Um, to you, you probably won't because they sit behind, they run the online classroom for Harvard's data analytics program. They run Yale's um, physician um, uh, assistance program. So, they, so if you want, if, if our listeners want to invest in ed tech, that would be a good oh, well, listed well, I'm company. a proud, super proud investor. If you're, yeah. if you're looking for a genuine investment, then um, there's such a growth opportunity with that brand. Um, and so, yeah, just full disclaimer, I'm an investor. We work with them. But, I, you know, the majority of my kids' future college fund is into you. Mm. Uh, I think they've got a huge, huge growth opportunity. Their founder, Chip Palchek, um, and they've got a great leadership team around them. Interesting. They, they, they have everything across the whole career continuum. So short courses, boot camps, undergrad now with LSC. So typically, if you're a, wow. a Dubai-based student, you travel to London, you'll spend $150,000 to do economics at LSC at undergrad. The whole wow. in. Wow. They've now got, they've now taken that degree with the University of London and they've put it online and you can now study in Dubai for that degree for $25,000 all in. Are some of your uh, students, I would call them, uh, the 10,000 people who work with at aid, do some of them do remote courses like that? The majority of them do remote. Okay. And, and, and growing. And how does that work? Like, uh, do you think, um, like, uh, are they getting value out of it? They don't have the network. Um, for, for many students, and you remember this to college days, there, there, there'll be some that want to go in, they want to go all in on varsity sport. They want to go all in on, on dating and the student union and, and doing this bit. But the world has moved on in terms of the only mm. place you can meet somebody, a, a boyfriend or a girlfriend is in the student union. The campus experiences will remain, but they will remain for those that want to want to pay for a, a slightly different experience. There are many students I was at university with that didn't want to hang out on campus, didn't yeah. want to sit in the coffee shops all day. Hmm. The, the actual taught experience on campus is typically eight to 12 hours per week. So yeah. actually what you're, what you're, th there is now this able to be able to, you can go full bundle with accommodation on campus. Or you can say for many students, there's a huge opportunity cost from uprooting their life, moving from Waterford to Chicago to go to Booth, and, and everything else is a huge cost for that. So for many of the experience will, will, will outweigh that cost. But for the, the bigger opportunity, how do you grow these markets online? Really great online experiences. Mm. I, I, you know, we work with most of the online education providers in the space. There's no one better in that space than 2U mm. because they've, they've built the platform for online. They didn't throw online in March for Zoom. They've got a multi-billion dollar company built. Digital classrooms and they partner yeah. with these universities. They invest upfront in building the digital experience. They work with the same lecturers. And so I think that there is a nuance. People just bundle online all in together. Zoom class isn't online. You can use Zoom, but how you use it, how you have and, and how you train your lecturers to deliver online is mm. very different from how you train. So it's, it's a continuous improvement process. Um, so I think that there's going to be a lot more innovation that comes in. How do universities partner with the likes of 2U to, to, to reach a broader orient, audience? Mm. The one thing that we, we, we see in the data is that when you're in markets like the UAE, Southeast Asia, India, Africa, is that higher education, people sniff at it a bit. There's a lot of commenters that say it's dead in the UK or US. And it might be that it's got a bit tired um, if you're a typical you know, person who's living and working in the US and that it's not giving them value for money. The opportunity for an international student who's coming from India or Africa to be able to study remotely at LSE on their undergrad program is huge. The Chinese market, the, the, the Korean market, the Indonesian market. The future for UK and US higher education, the biggest brands, is an export strategy, hmm. and the opportunity there is infinite. Fascinating. Yeah, and a lot of the a lot of brands are here. A lot of universities yep. here, like Manipal and Wollongong, 
uh, I was listening to um, uh, Satya Nadella's book yes. recently, and he studied in Manipal University in uh, India, yeah. and he's the CEO of Microsoft. That's a, that's a fascinating story. Uh, is that you know? Can you see those universities as well uh, having an export strategy? And does that work in the US? Yeah, without a doubt. And so, uh, what what it will come down to those universities that are willing to put their their outcomes and their revenue on the line and say, you know, we will, you pay us when you win and when you succeed. Okay. And then you, you change the incentive structure. So universities aren't these um, you know, gilded cities with um, high walls and saying to everyone to go away. What they're trying to, they actually change their entire recruitment cycle to who are the best and brightest minds, regardless of financial means up front. But they need money. They, like, they need... They, they don't. You know, the best universities can raise debt at half a percent. About okay. Base. Okay. They don't need debt. They, they don't need money. Need money. <laughs> okay. The endowments you've got. The but you, endowment you, size might of need, up. you might need money to fund the payments. Are you only paying? Yeah, we, we we can solve for that. Yeah, we, you scale solves for that. Okay. I, I just don't think we, we we make enough big bets on students. We know we don't have default to the platform. Our students double their household income within twenty four months of, of completing their outcomes. But the the the, the opportunity. Um, for financial technology and, and education to intersect to drive better outcomes and the demand drivers are huge. So, but, but it's also like, you know, it's also you're providing a service yeah. or an education um, that has value. So, so my, in, my, in my view, an education has value irrespective of if, it's, if that value pays back later yeah. because, uh, it, you know, knowledge compounds and uh, it's hard to measure in a job and... Yeah. You know, I always, I always um, relate my years in university or anything. It's helped me shape how I think. Yes. You know, and I still apply to it. You know, uh, a language and a business subject. It still relates a lot. Um, is it as simple as not as simple? But do you think that it's um, that point? Do they need to go into a performance model, or do they need to just change how they price? Um. Well, you could do both, but um, you know, we've been trying for years and years pricing as a leading indicator of quality, and all it's got is hyperinflation in, in higher education okay. without any discernible increase. So typically, you'd go, Fair to, enough. <laughs> you'd, you'd go to grad school and you'd, you'd, you'd spend, um, when I first started looking to go to Oxford's MBA, maybe 15 years ago, I think it was £27,000. Um, it's now best part of a hundred thousand pounds. Wow! Yet median incomes for graduates that are coming out of the Oxford MBA has not increased significantly. Yeah, and no, by nowhere near the same percentage. And so um, I would argue that, and also the, the two. That, that sounds like you're explaining a problem for them. Then, if it has an increase, then why would they change their cushy hundred k now? Because because there is there, there there will in future be no students to pay a hundred k up front. Okay. So 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 that they'll either have two choices: go out of business or innovate. Okay. And what will they do? We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Okay, interesting. So let's so, talk about um, you know the, the the students that you the platform. So uh, I'm interested in applying for a course. I don't have the means. Uh, somehow through a good review or recommendation or a decent podcast, they they <laughs> don't know if we have that audience. But so someone comes across the platform. Yeah. Uh, walk me through the process uh, of how I end up getting my university paid for. Well, typically, um, a student will come to us because they've applied to a program they really want to be on. Um, we help students discover some of the programs, but but typically, uh, they will go to one of our our, our program oh, partners. Nice. So, we if we said, um, uh, you know, software engineering at the University of Birmingham in the UK, or we said um, UCL's MBA program, uh, data science at Columbia, then they'd go to one of those courses, and then they'd be referred to Red Aid for for the payment plan. Um, and so we would put those on a kind of study now, pay later model. They'd spread the cost of their tuition maybe over 24, 48 months after they graduate. Um, there'd be no interest payments, but they would still have to, to pass. We may not have a hard credit check, but um, they still have to pass affordability checks. So we'd look at what their current outgoings are. And, and, bank and, statements, things yeah, like that. Yeah, and we, we, we use... We get a digital version of a bank statement using open banking, and okay. so we try to use where we haven't built something. We've tried to use the best in um, in class providers. So we'll work with Plaid or True Layer to get open banking information. Okay, we'll work with, these, yeah. Um, so uh, Pl Plaid uh, effectively gives um, has a direct integration with your bank account. So rather than you sending me a bank statement, you've been in Dubai long enough to know how many times you had to skip copies of your bank statement mm. via a secure API. Your bank would give me a copy mm. of your bank statement. Okay. So it's just it's, that I would approve it. Yeah, yeah. You'd approve it, yeah. and you'd be able to deny access. So it's a bit like the, the old Facebook API login. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but 
thousand times more secure. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Needs to be and Twitter at the moment. Yeah. So so okay. So I, there's no. I pay no interest. Yep. How do you make money? Uh, the university pays us. So effectively, uh, if you look at a business it, uh, from a business perspective, universities are trading off upfront cash flow um, and the administration of payment plans. A university still has to administer, even if the student's paying everything up front or via debt um, from a third party, they still got to have an administration team that administer all those payment plans. Who's paid? Have they paid? Can they start their cost? So we pick up a lot of that um, uh, HR, HR lift and technology lift and, yeah. and, and build that into our own platform. So I think that's the first and foremost thing. And then the second point is that we're doing all of that assessment, all the collection, all the reach out to the students. So that takes a huge amount of time for universities that we take off their hands. And so effectively we've built an end-to-end -end process and the, and the university pays us to run that. So it comes, normally University CS is just an acquisition fee, a cost of servicing the student, mm. um, which you would have anyway on its books. Um, but what you'll typically see is every classroom now has perishable inventory. So there are empty seats in the room. Mm. And at midnight on the first day of that Especially course. COVID, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. On midnight on that first um, on yeah. that first uh, day of the course, if those seats are empty, like a hotel that has empty beds at night, it, that, that so inventory is perished. Yeah. And so we help those universities grow their revenue per cohort. And so actually they're earning net, even after they pay our fee, which is only very small. Um, but maybe we've been increasing that now, but uh, <laughs> uh, they, they, their revenue per cohort, their revenue per seat increases okay. and they don't need to rely on bursaries as a way of discount. Most universities will say our tuition to this and we'll give you a, a bursary. The bursary is just a, effectively a fake discount. Okay, interesting. So are you on the FinTech EdTech and uh, are you more on the education because you're working with the universities more than you're working with finance? Yeah, no, we're, 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 uh, our business at core is, is financial technology okay. and then we intersect with ed education and ed tech providers yeah and so that's where the kind of bridge technology comes. so um are you plugged into lenders are you uh, and how do you view the future of that with blockchain and all, all that sort of stuff uh, I, I think I, i'm blockchain and distributed ledger technologies are obviously here and will continue to grow there's far brighter people that can speak to those and the future of those those industries but certainly um, as a storage of value or as a uh, distribution ledger technology we're, we're fairly interested in it but actually as a business we've tried not to become too sexy uh, in terms of fintech we've tried to look at how can you build a really robust end-to-end -end proprietary lending uh, platform mm. that does what it says in the tin that actually we spend our time trying to reduce the cost um, for our students rather than trying to find whizzy, clever ways to um, distract the consumer so that you can make more money. Mm. So I think there's a lot of fintech noise around how can we create greater arbitrage and that's great, good, good on to them. They'll be very venture backed. Um, we're, we're not in this for a quick turn and flip. We, we haven't taken any venture backing. Uh, we bootstrap the business from, from scratch to profitability and you know, we continue to grow and live within our means, and that's so, quite counterintuitive to most fintechs. You're already profitable, meaning that university students have gone through the university, yep. got a job, and then paid you back. Correct. Wow. <laughs> and it takes a bit of time. Financial services are very difficult to bootstrap because often the, the cost of getting regulated, you're in for a couple of million pounds up front regardless of what happens. Mm. So I can understand why many people have to raise early, um, but... And listen, if, if that's what you need, there's a great venture landscape out there, whether it's in the in the UAE or, or, or further afield. We just chose a different path. We knew we were, we were going to take a little bit longer to come to maturity. We see this as a 15, 20, 30 year play. And as a result, um, we'd rather we'd rather build a meaningful business at scale mm. that, that changes lives rather than being in tech crunch and having the vanity metrics of yeah. how much we raised. Because it's, 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 once again, it's, it's game of startups. It, it is BS. Yeah. Interesting. I wanted to move on to something else, but that's too interesting to let go. <laughs> um, because it is, it, you know, it's so, you know, people see sexiness, they see the articles, they see the kind of hype, they see the exit stories. And uh, we started out in a co working space and yeah. the startup. I sorry? I remember. Yeah, it was in uh, Astro, it was a great place and yeah. amazing, but like I, I could see people going in there wearing flip flops and I was just thinking to myself that that's their gap here mm. and it's uh, I'm doing a startup I'm a founder yeah. but there's no intention to build something meaningful o over time it's uh, raise money uh, no focus on profitability and I want to get out and then uh, and then you know, you don't even own the company like you just have it's another loan right yeah. and uh, it's not great good <laughs> so um, so I like 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I agree with you. It is BS, but uh, you know, like you're doing it the opposite way because of that, or um, I don't think it's about doing the opposite. I think it, we all have to find our truth. That might have been those guys and girls' truth at that time, but um, you you really wish perhaps like, coming to the, the industry and, and and having made a few mistakes in the past and learn kind of hard way. The other thing is that. I've done my fair share of really base jobs and, and no job's been more important than what I've had. You know, I've cleaned dishes, I've worked in old people's homes, I've worked in hospices and, and you learn so much more by doing, you learn more about people, you learn more around what people need, the real world people. And I think that often what's happened recently is there's been this idea of people used to go from, from business school or grad school or undergrad into working in the best FMCG companies or they used to go into to working for Wall Street because that was the way forward. And now everyone else wants to become a startup founder. They want to raise a lot of money to spend a lot of liquidity. Either they, work for Google or become Google. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and so, and, and yeah, I always, I was found perhaps it's a, a kind of, British shopkeeper mentality. I'd rather I'd rather create jobs than, than than have a job. I'm also deeply unemployable. I'm not sure anyone actually ever employed me, so I had no other option but to build. And and therefore, if you're going to build, you're going to and you've only got. Why are you unemployable? <laughs> <laughs> but, but perhaps what we'll see. Um, but I think it's I don't I don't um, suffer fools gladly. I don't listen to a lot of the dogmatic thinking in a room, and I tend to challenge quite a lot. Mm. And so that's not necessarily great if you want to go and raise money from people that have never built anything themselves. The majority of people that 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 lend or fund companies have built. F all. Yeah. And so I, I don't necessarily need to take advice from someone who's just uh, graduated Stanford and gone to join the Silicon Valley. You know, uh, and there are some great people in venture, so it's not to, yeah. to disventure at all. Um, yeah. It's like with the universities, you can find the right partner. It's, 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 there's a, there's a, there's, oh, like in any industry, there's a distribution curve. Yeah. And, uh, but... And so, but the, there, there's been a, a fetishization of hustle porn. There's been a fetishization of, of startup culture. And actually, the world is full of real genuine startups. They are, they are Indian and Pakistani immigrants into the UK and US building corner shops. You know, that, the real businesses making real money. And, and I'm all for the big moon shops and the idea of, you know, Andreessen Horowitz talking about kind of, um, you know, building better. But there are very people then use that narrative to go and build some 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 other kind of crappy thing. Tom, what's your advice for yourself in terms of how do you advise advise the students to manage that? How would you advise me? Like for you know, to be transparent, we want to grow. I tell my board that we want to grow, but we need investment to grow. Yeah. We don't want to uh, be treated like a tech company in media, but we know that media companies do have some tech. Yeah. We see what Netflix is doing, it's still about content and all this sort of thing. And the same with education. At some point, it's important to get debt. It's, yeah. you know, well, it's, tech, le it's leverage is incredibly powerful, so we're not anti-leverage at all. Actually, I think- Oh, well, how do you go about it? Uh, well, listen, <laughs> you've kind of bundled education. I think if we just, the education piece, the majority of students, there's, if you're in a country where there's a really good uh, government system go for that every time because it tends to have some kind of element insurance provision built in certainly in the UK you absolutely we have a student loan company it's, it's deeply imperfect but um, uh, it has some insurance protections and you won't ever pay back until you earn over a threshold you're guaranteed the funding they'll fund your undergrad and your living costs you know, they'll fund your postgrad and living costs so in certain countries absolutely the UK has an incredible higher education system and it's incredibly well funded but for the majority of people around the world where the future of education is there is no funding and so um, yeah we think at any we're part of that solution but I think more importantly moving on to the idea debt is always better yeah. yeah, debt is always better than equity in terms of uh, because you're pricing in risk um, when someone's giving you equity into your business mm. they typically don't know, you know what the risk profile is so, so they end up taking more of your business than you're really going to want to give away because they there's asymmetrical information you're mad passionate about you know, what you're building here in Augustus and, and Smashy and everything and, and loving they don't quite know yet what that opportunity is or it's it's so they're having to price risk in Debt's often difficult, difficult to find, difficult to, to, to fund when you're when you're young because you've got no track record and the whole debt thing's based on kind of thirty six months worth of bank statements. So it's real catch twenty two. That's where often friends and family rounds come in. Mm -hmm. It's where some of these kind of um, alternative lending platforms have started to come in. Mm -hmm. But the other one is that I think the opportunity that we don't think and learn from other industries. So you're a media. The opportunity and I know you do, but many don't. 
in that if you look at retail, the idea of how can we get stuff on consignment? How can we get inventory on consignment? How can we look at um, Gymshark's a great business because it's effectively got um, negative cash flow in terms of that. It, it doesn't pay out its suppliers. Gymshark? Gymshark's a um, apparel brand in the UK that's grown, bootstrapped itself okay. to be a real force of nature in the thing, in, in the, in the um, athleisure yeah. um, oh, okay, consumer okay. outfit wear. And they've done great job of building the business on social media. They've got a really young founder. They're going to go, they'll be the next Under Armour. They'll do Amazing. some great things. You should check them out. They're, they've got a really great founder there and a really great business. But what they did early, because they were super small, they used their size and said to their suppliers, we've got a great business and a great brand, but we're not going to be able to pay you for six months. So mm. they get paid, they get all their returns and everything done, Good. and they would pay out six months. Yeah. Amazon's another business that, that, that does that, whereas most um, most businesses the other way, they have to buy their, their clothing yeah. And in retail and they only get Mine paid. Mine says their shoe, shoe dog story, the difficulty they have with financing that. Design. Exactly. So it's yeah. just trying to learn from, from other industries and try and see, well, where, where is the, where can you build arbitrage? Where are there, where is their perishable inventory? In, yeah. in Dubai now and media, there's so much underutilized inventory. Yeah. How could you effectively get that on consignment and say, well, we'll help you fill it potentially, but you know, we, we are we, we, with, with eyeballs, but you're going to, you're going to have to price it at a far different rate yeah. and so when you're small and building something uh you know it's just looking for those moments of of arbitrage i think there's a lot of bs again about like if you if you do what you love you'll never work a day in your life honestly building a business is just like chewing barbed wire and so uh, yeah, it, it's good quote <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it's and so you know i i you know haven't seen Mm. You know, my children for, for years as much as I should do and, and, and I'm on as we touched upon I spent seven weeks yeah. in flight last year and, and it matters to me and it matters to show them that I'm a you know a parent that can build and show a really good example to my kids and it's always a tough trade-off of how much time do I get to, to, to see my son versus you know how much am I showing him that this is how you build something but mm. um interesting and, so but you've had a bit more time lately yeah, it was just been, it was been incredible. But it's those internal conflicts. But building a business is really hard, um, and it should be hard. Building things that matter should be hard. And 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 what times like recessions do is they just cut out all the the, the noise and they cut out all the all, all the pretenders yeah. and, and really leave the likes of yourself around in the market finding a way. And, and you know yourself, it's just non-linear. And so all all we try and employ in people is that you just realize what you really want to embark upon. It isn't it isn't the hoodies and the swag and the tech crunch articles and everything else. It will feel like chewing barbed wire. It will feel like at the end mm. of the month you used to celebrate because you used to get paid. And now you're working out how you're going to make payroll each mm. month. Brilliant. That's very clear. <laughs> Talking about uh, the Middle East, uh, you mentioned kind of other parts of the world, but let's specifically talk about education here. From what you've seen, how could you describe it? What's their heritage legacy? What are the universities like? And uh, how important is education in, um, you know, we see the leadership, we see what the visions are for many countries in the Middle East. Um, I always ask on this podcast, it, you know, this is an emerging market. Like when I was younger, China was an emerging market. The made in China Thing isn't really there anymore. Yeah. It's made in Taiwan, but China has emerged. Yes. Brazil hasn't. Yes. India hasn't. The Middle East hasn't. What does it take and how, what role is education in that? I mean, the one thing that we have, certainly if we're talking about the UE lens, is there's just incredible leadership. So His Highness Sheikh Mohammed, Tomb, is somebody who has always seen education so as a first priority. So I think they've created a, an economy here where it, it, it's an anchor for the region for people to come and have safety, security, a place which has got great schools. So I think the, the K-12 is really where they've excelled. So that's the kind of um, kindergarten through to, to year 12, the kind of secondary, primary, secondary education that everyone goes through. I think that's where they've really excelled. Here, yeah. Yeah, and companies like GEMS have built global empires based off the, the sure. infrastructure which the Dubai government has provided. Um, I think the next iteration is going to be, and um, we've got some exciting things I'll have to come back and announce with you, but right. is around um, how do we build out the ability for, and for many years people have had to cut, be in the region of the kind of wider GCC, wider media region, but travel abroad to go and study. Yeah. And actually I think the opportunity now for the innovation online is how can you live in Dubai with all the safety and security, come from Jordan or Pakistan or, or, or Lebanon, live in Dubai, but study on great programs at Columbia, great programs at MIT, great programs at Harvard from Dubai. Mm. And I think where Dubai will be in, in, in that it was previously a trading post for many years and then it moves into a tourism based economy i think dubai's future is going to be an education based economy wow. where it uses its 
global kind of network and connectivity and it's a um, place where many businesses and educators want to be. Has and, great and students and nice place to live. And, exactly. Yeah. And so you get the idea of that effectively it, Dubai is, is as, a, as a nation, a campus, yeah. which will have wow. it, with, with students from all universities studying online, not having to travel because sometimes there's visa issues. I mean, the United States government have done probably the, 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 the worst play ever of taking the pin out the hand grenade and holding onto it mm. in terms of its approach to, to students. Attracting students. Attracting students. Yeah. Um, so right. Canada will win, the UK will win, Australia will win, but many students can't just travel there. Um, culturally, a lot of families don't want to send daughters off to foreign countries. Mm. And so a lot of those young women have been locked out of education because they haven't had the chance to, to fly, particularly from the broader, you know, um, uh, Indian subcontinent and everything else. So how can we facilitate, how can Dubai facilitate a kind of global campus within Dubai? Mm. I think there's going to be some really exciting opportunities. With there. international brands, with funding partners, things Absolutely. like that. That's really interesting. Different way of looking at it. Yeah. So there, there is good opportunity for people to have education from here. What about if I'm in another country in Kuwait, Oman, uh, or Jordan? Uh, do you think, you know, what's the prospects? Like, also on a wider level, how do we inspire or how does one inspire people to educate? You, t- you talked a lot about underprivileged people. Uh, you know, our um, office manager here was the first person in her family to go to a university degree, and I, and you mentioned that as well. Like, how do we? How does this region have more of those people? I think it's about it's about building role models. And I'd love to to speak to your office manager. It's about how do you. Um Building community is so important. So rather than this idea, and we've, I think we're, we're post the age of the influencer and the macro influencer. I think we, we move into a, a world of micro influencer where rather than someone trying to have a million followers, it's how can one person show the way for 10, 15 or 100 of their friends and family that they're, they're the change maker within their community. Mm. I think that actually the micro influencer is going to be really powerful. And it's not about you know, clicks and views, but actually people being able to tell their story their way because that actually leads to job opportunities doesn't have to have millions of followers to inf- influence the HR manager. So nice. the first, yeah. my family I've gr- grifted and grafted and and, and 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 kind of clawed my way up. And I was the first in my family to university and I was the first to go and work for a tech startup. I didn't go to try and work for a big brand. I wanted to have greater accountability and portfolio within my work. Mm. And that then leads to bigger and better outcomes. It also means right. that um, employers and founders like us, we have to, if we've come from those backgrounds and we want to be the difference, we have to take bigger risks. We can't return to the mean and just hire people because they, and it's so easy to do, like what's the boxes we can check when we're, check when we're hiring? You know, we have to be as bold in our ambition in terms of building as we are in hiring to hire people of color, to hire people from different um, ethnic or religious backgrounds, to hire right. people that, that don't look, sound and taste like us. So uh, interesting. And I wanted to ask about that. We saw the Black Lives Matter movement, but the wider gender uh, the issues that we have on companies. And I don't know, you probably read articles around what you're talking about in that topic. I didn't. I didn't look, ever see it from that point of view, that there's an issue with applying for universities. There's an issue with lending. There's, you know, you know, it's we're criti- we're quickly to, we're quick to criticize companies with boards who are all white, all male, but actually they can't really choose. I'm not defending them, but yeah. I'm saying that the problem could be at a grassroots level. Uh, do you find that? Yeah. Well, well I'd say um, in in the same way that I, I wouldn't uh, go out and say you know you're you're you know, white men and therefore you're, you're immediately X. I think that we, we can't just reverse the, 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 the bigotry, but yeah, the diversity abs- is important. But, but absolutely we, we, we have that there is the problem starts at K 12. It starts with, um, children from a young age. If they're not able to read with a parent every day at bedtime, their, their linguistics will fall behind their phonics will fall behind by the age four, the opportunity gap is starting to, to, to emerge. And by age 11, I don't have the numbers to hand, so I'm not going to try and yeah, fake think, them. But, yeah. but the opportunity gap is exacerbated, and every year it just compounds. It's, a, it's like debt and interest. And so and those families will come from slightly lower social income, so they have less economic opportunity, less opportunity to do the, the after-school clubs and everything else. That said, that's not an excuse, but what it means is that, is that actually the, the problem starts at the bottom of the pyramid. So we have to start at the bottom and work up, but it's endemic, it's, it's endemic in in 
consumer credit where, where people of colour will um, experience you know, five times the level of graduate school debt that people for people of, uh, of Caucasian background. Um, the that debt grows to ten x by after five years because it, they're not able to pay off as fast, and so the, the, the debt and the interest compounds. And mm-hmm. so I think that there is a huge opportunity to to really try and level the playing field. But um, when hiring, we are we have to now if we're really going to solve this problem, we have to be very deliberate in our hiring. We have to seek out people of difference rather than saying, "Well, we didn't have any applications." So I think that the critique and, and the fault is people saying, "Well, we didn't have any applications. We're based in." Arkansas or Minnesota, we just didn't have the mm. applicants. Mm. I just think that's, that's, that, that's, that's utter nonsense. Mm. And so I think we all have a collective responsibility now. And it's not diversity. It's not about making this United Colors of Benetton advert in every company. It's about saying, how do we get the best and brightest people in here and ensuring that we don't, that we counteract our conscious bias. That's leading to sport in the same way that you'll naturally lead a way you swim. You'll naturally lead a way that you train the gym. You'll naturally think if you're not a cardio guy, you're going to move away from cardio and do some strength work. If you're not doing strength work in pieces, we have to, to, to fix our weaknesses by doing more of them. And so we're only going to get better cardio by doing more cardio. So if, if, if we need to look at diversity of, of thinking, of color, of race, of gender, we just need to go and spend more time in those communities to get better at it. Mm. It's just hard. It's hard the first time you go out for a run in the summer heat in Dubai. It's hard the first time you go and ask a girl out on a date. You feel nervous and you don't quite know about it. You can't quite work each other out yet. I think the, be- the things that matter most and the best for us are just really hard and mm. we tend to fear them up front. And I just, I just really implore people to, there are so many there's so many community groups out there. You only have to put Black Lives Matter into to a search engine on Twitter or social media, and you're in that community. And and so stop posting crappy black squares on your on, on your Instagram as, as a way of showing solidarity and do something about it. And that means the next day you go onto a college campus and you actively seek out people that you would otherwise not normally seek out if you're doing campus recruiting and stop putting numbers and percentages and everything else. Just just live a truth which is just more broader and open-minded. And I think it, it, people's businesses will be better for it. Brilliant. Then we'll leave it at that. Good point. Thanks a lot, Tom. That's a real pleasure. It's lovely to see you. Thank you. You too. Hey guys, I'm Richard Fitzgerald. This is Dubai Works, where we interview the business leaders making a difference in this great city. That business with scalability was very interesting to me. I like building something that has legacy.